Our first guest tonight is an American treasure and one of the greatest directors of all. His new movie, his 26th, is the epic Western crime saga, Killers of the Flower Moon. It opens in theaters and IMAX on Friday. Please welcome Martin Scorsese. <laughs> Two kids. What happened to what? Those two kids. Oh, the kids we kicked out. They're yeah. in the alley. We beat them up pretty oh, bad. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How you doing? It's Jen? great to see you. You too. I indulged in a little Marty Scorsese uh, world last night. I watched a whole bunch of things. I watch Italian American, the oh, video you the, made about yeah. your parents' the documentary. I watch it at least twice a year, sometimes oh, more than great. that. That's and great. I love it so much. It's just unbelievably great. It reminds me of, I feel like I'm watching my own home movies oh, that's watching that's fantastic, it. yeah. I have a question for you about that. And if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. It's easy to watch. It's, it's great. It's on Criterion Channel, I think, yeah. Yeah, and, but you can, but sorry, they put it on YouTube for free They put also. it on YouTube for free. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it called Italian American with no hyphen, no capital? Because it became that. I mean, they were, you know, my grandparents were Sicilian. Mm -hmm. They were, I guess, Sicilian American. And then somehow they created the generation. My generation really was no hyphen. We become more American, so it becomes one Italian American. And now my children are more. American Italian. American Italian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully it doesn't thing. it doesn't keep diminishing until there's. I don't know. I mean, that's the story of you know the immigrants coming here, changing, assimilating, but holding on to a culture like, in, it, especially in terms of Italian American, the food was always the key. Yeah, right. In yeah. fact, you put your mom's sauce or gravy recipe, yes. as we call it, and yes. meatball recipe yes. in the credits yeah. of the film, yeah. which has <laughs> probably never been done before or yeah. since. Yeah. No, well, that was a big deal. And, and she, what she would do, she, she would, you know, tell you certain things. I wouldn't, if you want to follow that recipe, go ahead. But you have to be able to improvise a bit because she wouldn't tell you everything. Because otherwise, the sister-in-law will find out. It's... And then she uses it. And the, and the mother-in-law finds out. And that kind of, no, this is their, her way of doing it. You think that's why? Because I always wonder, it is always very hard with, like, Italian grandmas to oh. get the recipe. No, they will not do you it. You can't get the recipe. No. Even if they're trying to give you the recipe, they won't. There's they something don't. in the DNA. It won't happen. Yeah. It won't happen. They want you to go to them. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> we make the best. <laughs> like I mean? the colonel or something. <laughs> you uh, uh, found, um, how, how did you, Robbie Robertson, your longtime collaborator, right. who we were fortunate enough to get to know here, you guys, how did you guys meet? Um, he passed away in August, and yes, I'm sorry yeah. For, yeah, for that. Me too, me um, too. How did you guys, when did it happen that you met Robbie? Well, I met him through Jonathan Taplin, who was um, who had produced Mean Streets. Mm -hmm. And uh, they showed a screening of the film for him at Warner Brothers, and we met there at that point. But, you know, there was a, the band was a very, very special group. I mean, that sound that came out of them from the Big Pink, I don't know, it sounded like nothing else mm -hmm. in, in the world ever. Uh, and it's a combination of so many different musical um, uh, uh, threads throughout American culture. And so um, I saw them at Woodstock. I was on the stage at Woodstock. I was one of the ADs. Uh, but at Woodstock, they weren't, they didn't, they didn't really want to be part of it. And so they didn't allow the cameras to come up on stage. They were quite formidable. They were kind of looking at us mm -hmm. in a way. And we couldn't get, one of the key things about Woodstock is the cameramen get on the stage and they work with the, with the performers. So we had loved them. We were listening to, to every one of the songs, et cetera. But we always felt that, uh, that um, they had felt, that they, who were these people coming up to Woodstock? It's their place. Right. Why were these 500,000 people here? Who right. are they? Right. You know, what do they want? So they played, <laughs> they played more for the audience and not for the film. So we were always a little bit, standoffish in a way until I met him uh, uh, at the screening of Mean Streets and he was uh, very gracious um, and then Jonathan Taplin uh, the producer of Mean Streets called at one point I was finishing up New York New York about a year later uh, and he said uh, listen there's going to be a, a final concert and they're going to have you know Muddy Waters there they're going to have Van Morrison they're going to have Eric Clapton they're going to have Joni Mitchell those guys and he said we need to get some kind of recording of this thing and then we met at Beverly Hills, a restaurant, Chinese restaurant, 
and we started talking, and uh, we found we had kind of the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess he did. And yeah. um, uh, in fact, you know, our keyboard player Jeff Babco yeah. played on the soundtrack of um, Killers, Killers of the Flower Moon wow. with um, Robbie, and um, he said it was an incredible experience. Yeah. And he he told me something that I I don't think I've ever heard before. Is I think most directors, and correct me if I have this wrong, will make the movie and then the they they, they spot it. And then with they the, put with the, the composer. music in. Well, Robbie, we didn't do that. We talked about what the sound was like. He was talking about wailing, wailing. I said, he knows I like guitars. And so at one point I said, these coyotes out here, these coyotes. And he had the guitar sound like, oh, the howling of the coyote. You, you hear it throughout the picture. Yeah. And, and other things, I said, I want something for this movie that's, that's kind of uh, dangerous and fleshy and sexy, but dangerous. And that was the theme he gave me all the way through with a kind of thump, thump. Some, some, da -dum, da -dum, almost like a bolero as the film kind of circles around itself until finally it explodes, you know? And he gave us that. But what he does, he just gives it to me. And I lay it in. Right. And then I say, hey, Rob, it's not working in this place. What can you give me here? That, that guitar piece, they say, pull that guitar piece out. He'll put, put a keyboard thing in from, from somewhere else. So he never really, except maybe for the opening sequence with the oil gushes, I don't want to give it away, but there's a, a beautiful a piece of music that he created for that which I said, I need something really strong there. Was this movie in particular special for him? Because I know his uh, mother yeah. grew up on a, a Native Canadian Mohawk. reservation. And, yeah, First yeah. Nations, First Nations. So he was on the res. He was on the res. He grew up it. on the reservation. On the res. Yeah. And he, then he went on the road by himself at 16 years old. Just started traveling. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, no, I love him. Yeah, you had and you had a, obviously a connection where you could direct him in the way that you speak to an actor, where you yes. tell him what you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, and that happened on The Last Waltz. Uh, particularly in the scenes where he's being interviewed, he, he would he started calling me maestro all the time because sometimes I would get nervous, especially when we didn't have, uh, not all the time, I don't get nervous all the time, but sometimes I do. So, uh, <laughs> but Rob would be standing there and he's so cool, you know, he's the essence of cool, doesn't say anything. And he's, I'm interviewing him and at the, uh, <laughs> what I would do, because there was no video assist at the time, if I wanted him to go faster, i go, then slow. Slow, <laughs> easy. And he and finally he called me every time, Maestro. And now people think it's some pretentious thing like Maestro. No, it came from Robbie. It's just him <laughs> making fun of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Maestro is here. Come on. You, know. you um, religion is obviously a big yeah. theme in a lot of your movies, and um, in this case as well, I think um, different religion, yes. not your yeah. typical. You yeah. were you were an altar boy for how long? Uh, for about four years, uh -huh. and then I was I was always so late at the seven o'clock mass that they threw me out. Is that right? You got. Yeah. <laughs> They said, don't, 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 just the don't. You had to do 7 a.m. mass? Yeah, the, the, old, the older ladies were there from the neighborhood in black, you know. Yeah, and would you nuns. ring the bells? The, yes. Yeah, you have to do yeah. it the right time. It's a lot of pressure, isn't it? I have, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and and the, the, the cruets. Yeah, the, the cruets, sure, yeah. The water and wine. I liked it. It's just that, I, you know, I, 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 I could not get that myself together for that 7 o'clock mask get up at 6.30. I couldn't 7 o'clock yeah, is for the kids that um, are not behaving themselves, Yes, I, I think, know. Right? I think so. I yeah, think it's like so. a punishment. But yeah. we all stayed friends, and the priest who was in charge of all that was a very great mentor to me, Father Principe. I had the say. same experience. Yeah, yeah a lot he of people love to talk about the terrible experiences they no, had. No, this guy was amazing. He gave us, the first thing he gave us was uh, books by uh, Graham Greene. Then really? he gave us books by James Joyce, then Dwight McDonald, you know. I mean, this guy was quite something. He was a great, uh, he was in his young, he was early, early 20s. Uh, and he said, open your mind, man. Here, start reading. Start reading. Because, my you know, priest at my um, church where I was a, an altar boy, I went to his um, 50th anniversary of priesthood yeah. uh, uh, about a year ago, and I presented him with a large nude painting of himself. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and he, he appreciated it. Yes, he did. It's, it's, it's not hanging, but... <laughs> I'll get you a copy of it. Martin Scorsese is here. His movie's called Killer of the Flower Moon. It opens Friday. We'll be right back. He told me he was, he was going with Matt Williams for a time. You talk too much. No, I don't talk too much. Just thinking who I got to beat in this horse race, that's all. I didn't realize this was a race. I don't care for watching horses. Well, I'm a different kind of horse. Hong <laughs> Fashi. 
Shomikasi, Koshi Ajami. What was that? Shomikasi. That's how you are. I don't know what she said, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> that is Leonardo DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone in Killers of the Flower Moon. She's uh, he's great, of course. We know he's great. She's but fantastic. She, she is amazing. I, you know, what you see there at that moment when he did when he said, "I don't know what that is, but it must be Indian for handsome devil." That's an improv, and that's really her laughing. And there you see how they came together as actors. And, and from that of... moment, that throughout the whole picture, we were like, we were like a unit. Oh, that was the... it. That's where it happened. Yeah, yeah. In that scene. Does that sometimes happen too late with actors, where it happens late in the I, run? I hope it doesn't. That's yeah. the key. I mean, yeah. uh, but this one, no, she, you see, the thing with her, I, I just saw her in this film, Certain Women by Kelly Reichardt, and uh, Ellen Lewis got this film for me, and she said, I think this is the one. And we looked at her. There was something about her face um, and her eyes that you could see all the, you feel what's going on intellectually and emotionally, and she hardly has to show much. It's all there in the eyes. It's almost like uh, a film that was that influenced this a great deal, uh, The Heiress, like Olivia de Havilland in The, in the Heiress. I'm nodding, uh, but I don't know uh, that yeah, Montgomery Clift in <laughs> Yes, of course, she's <laughs> wonderful. But anyway, there's a thing about her face that ultimately we just could not. She has a dignity and she has a strength. And uh, uh, whenever we whenever we had questions, we'd bring them to her. She's she, great. She really is. And yeah. she'd worked very closely with the Osage. The Osage were, were the Osage Nation. They were in front of the camera, behind the camera. That's uh, the other thing that blew my mind. Yeah. So I saw the movie, and these actors are all great. And then I'm looking, I'm reading about it, and I'm looking at pictures of you with these leaders, the Osage leaders, yes, and I realized these men are the actors in the film. Yeah, they're in the picture. You yeah. never know they weren't actors. N no, I know, I know. Is they that a bad thing for actors when you take people who aren't actors well, and make them just as good as the people well, well, who are? Well, well, I've had that, I've had that said to me note over the years, but the point is that in this case, in terms of the Native American indigenous people, you've got to deal with the, who they are. You can't have people coming in and, uh, you know, playing them in a way. And as many as, as we could get to perform in front of the camera, they did. There's an incredible scene between a man named Ernest uh, Everett Waller and uh, um, uh, the chief, um, the chief standing bear, in the roundhouse where they talk about the, the, the tragedy that has occurred. Uh, and it goes on. And that's unscripted. It is. I put the guy, uh, you know, De Niro came out. He heard the guy talking. He said, do you hear that guy? I said, yeah. I said, so I went back into the, to the hut. And we were, it was a set. And I got to tell you, um, we were shooting at a, a, peer, a, a time where um, it, it was getting into summer, and it was like 105, 110 degrees. So it was very hot. So I came out to get some air. And even Bob came out and said, Marty, this guy, listen. And I went back in. He was talking to the people, the, the other extras that were there. And I asked him, I said, Everett, can you do that again? Only sitting down. He says, put your cameras there. Two cameras on both of them. And I let him wail. And he wails for all the indigenous people of the world. Wow. It's right there. What, and what a <laughs> unbelievable story, a terrible yeah, story. Oh, my God. Hard to, a story that is difficult to believe that this, this happens. And... Yeah, they, they moved, they came from, I think, Missouri to Kansas, and then they were moved out of Kansas again by more settlers, and they bought some land from the Cherokee in, uh, in the reason they bought the land, uh, the only, they're the only Native American uh, 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 group, uh, nation, that were able to buy the land um, from the Cherokee. And they settled in a place in Oklahoma that was arid and had no farming. And they said, the white man's not going to want to be here. And they said, the white man also will not put iron in ground, meaning the uh, railroad. And while they're there, and it's miserable for a few 20 years or whatever, all of a sudden, oil is discovered. Yeah, like they, Beverly Hillbilly style. Exactly. Yeah. And they own it. They own it. So then, when the oil comes around, or they, suddenly, all these you know, European Americans, we all go in there, and these guys come in. and. Next thing you know, it turns out that the oil, uh, the, the head rights uh, for the oil and the money goes through the feminine side of the female side of the family. So you have a lot of guys start marrying the Native American women. And then some of those women start dying. Yeah. 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 And a true story. True story. True story. Crazy. And we never know. We never know how many really went down um, because, quite honestly, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker. You know, I'm a urban person. Yeah, we knew that. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> And I'm telling you, Jimmy, when I got out there, the prairie, 
Yeah. You know, you could do, I mean. You hadn't been world. on a prairie much, no, had you? No, yet. no, Not no. a lot of prairie time in your no, life? No, 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 no. Camping, ever go camping? No, no. No, no. <laughs> 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 Have you ever been to an REI store? No, no. no. It was like I got, you know, I, I told Fran Liebowitz, I said, Fran, I'm in a forest. She goes, Marty, you said a forest? I said, yeah. She goes, does it have more than one tree? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's like three trees, I think. That's about it. You know. Well, somehow you made a, a beautiful movie. Uh, it's called Killers of the Flower Moon. It opens in theaters and IMAX on Friday. Martin Scorsese, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back with Mike 